uh, you can go ahead and, and um, include that when we get to that point. Meanwhile, if you will join me in the prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, we're moving on through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we are at Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. If you were to read the first part of Matthew 4, you would see this is Matthew's version of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness immediately after his baptism. We're skipping over that part. That's going to show up again in Lent. Uh, and we're going on to this story, Matthew's version of Jesus calling his first disciples. I will be reading this from the New Living Translation. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then he left there and moved to Capernaum, beside the Sea of Galilee, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This will... Wait, what? Are you all still there? Yes. Okay, uh, I just got a notice from... Oh, thanks. Hang on just a minute. <laughs> uh, oh. Okay. Um. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, what's happening here? Okay, all right. And I just got a note from Linda that she did star six, but I didn't hear you. Do you wanna try it again? Okay. <laughs> this is Chris, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I'm not sure what's, what happened. Um, well, okay. All right, let me back up. Uh, Move to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah. In the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the sea, beyond the Jordan River, in Galilee where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them. Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. As you can tell, if you are on Zoom and you can see the background behind me, there is a boat. And this is the story of Jesus calling four guys to come join him to fish for people. So I wonder what sort of memories you all have of fishing. Uh, do, you, do you fish a lot? Have you never fished? Have you had good experiences of fishing? Have you had meh experiences of fishing? Um, just 
think what sorts of things I the, the memories that come to mind for me of a time when my brother caught a crawdad and uh, that was unexpected um, a time two different times when we went out on a boat into the water and went fishing one time in the Gulf of Mexico and another time on Chesapeake Bay with family I remember another time my uncle Bob uh, we went to this um, uh, uh, dam, stock dam, or it was it was it was bigger than a pond, but not a lake, um, in South Dakota, and he just caught bluegill after bluegill after bluegill, uh, which most of went into the potato patch because nobody wanted to eat bluegill for dinner. <laughs> so, thinking of that, um, uh, this this passage of Jesus calling these first four disciples is very similar to the passages in Luke and Mark. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have Jesus calling four guys that were on the shore of a lake who were fishing. And we get that wonderful um, it's, it's, uh, sentence that he says to them, follow me and I'll teach you to fish for people. Woo, that's great. We, we all love that one. Um, but that's not really the point of this story. We tend to get caught up on that detail, uh, or we get caught up on the very shocking speed with which these four guys all leave their livelihood and follow Jesus. Wow, that must have been a miracle. And I've preached sermons emphasizing both of these things, the, 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 the fishing and the fishing for people and the immediacy of Jesus' call and their trust and their capacity to drop everything and go after him. But there is a detail I hadn't really considered uh, that has nothing and maybe everything to do with fishing. It's where and how this story starts in Matthew's gospel. It starts at the very beginning of this reading with John being arrested. Now we get more detail about why John was arrested later in the gospel, and there's more detail about that in Mark and Luke as well. Um, but this offhand remark, when Jesus, when Jesus heard John had been arrested, he went to this particular place. It, it just, it's sort of a throwaway kind of thing, and it seems to suggest that the people who heard this story for the very first time knew uh, why John had been arrested. Uh, so it was just kind of like, it, it, uh, for Matthew, he was anchoring it in time for the people who were listening to him. And for those of us 2,000 years later, we kind of have to search a little bit to find out, gee, why was John arrested? Um, but this suggests that people who heard this, who, who were hearing this story, knew the story. So Matthew doesn't dwell on, the re on John being arrested, which leaves us a little mystified. Um, and we, we find out later in Matthew's gospel that the reason John was jailed was Herod Antipas, who was King Herod's son, was fed up with John. John had said things, true things, one too many times, and Herod was finished with him. So off to prison. So we start off this passage with Jesus hearing about his arrest and he turns and he heads back north toward his hometown. Um, again, like I said, as I began reading this, this just prior to this story in Matthew's gospel is Jesus' baptism in the wilderness. So he returns from his 40 days of experience in the wilderness outside the Jordan. And here's John's been arrested. So he it's like, you know, you can almost see it in, in like a movie here. Jesus, you know, bedraggled and hungry and probably really dirty coming back out of the of the wilderness. And he hears this and it's like he doesn't even put anything down. He doesn't even take time to get anything to eat. He just turns and he heads north and he goes home. Uh, Matt Skinner at uh, Sermon Brainwave says that this episode is a trigger for calling his disciples. It's not just that his friend and his cousin is in jail, but it is that the local tyrant, Herod Antipas, has crossed a line and there needs to be a response. 
Herod is not going to extinguish John's ministry so easily. So Mark and Luke already have Jesus in Galilee when he begins calling his disciples, assembling his crew. And Matthew has Jesus return from a time of trial in the wilderness, hearing about John and heading home. And again, if this were a movie, you could, you could, the camera would pan on Jesus' face as he receives this information. However, he would react and he would turn and then the camera would dolly back, zoom out, and there would probably be some sort of heroic music that would happen as Jesus turns and walks into the distance. Now, Jesus returns to Galilee and the land of the Gentiles and Israel's history. Now, the geographic references at the very beginning of this reading are pretty easily overlooked. Uh, Naphtali and Zebulon. Those were two of uh, Jacob's sons, part of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, But they're more than that in this story, and they are more than just locations in Galilee. For those who would listen to Isaiah 800 years before this story starts, so 2,800 years ago for us, these places, Zebulon and Naphtali, are the places where there were humiliating losses for the people of Israel, both at the hands of Babylon and at the hands of Assyria. Now, God's promise through the prophet Isaiah, which Matthew directly quotes, and that we read every Christmas Eve, the people sitting in darkness have seen a great light, on them light has dawned, is that the people who have lost everything in war are the people that God chooses to shed light on, to say, I'm about to do something brand new. Now, for us in a contemporary setting, this would be like Jesus uh, coming back from some time away, um, being told by somebody that your friend and your cousin John's in jail, been arrested, and then Jesus would go to Saigon in 1975, a place that symbolizes the hell of war and the darkness in which people left behind are living. And you can think of any other place, any other time in our world's history where there has been a horrific war leaving people in devastation, leaving people behind, leaving people hopeless, leaving people in rubble. It's happening now in our own world, not just in Ukraine, but in other places. So Matthew starts out his gospel, but this passage in the gospel, with Jesus returning to an historical place to shine light that God's promise has been fulfilled and that he is the one that is going to begin a new reign of light and peace. He goes back to an historically significant place and begins to preach John's message of repentance and getting ready. Now, when we hear about John baptizing for repentance for the forgiveness of sins, we tend to think of that as being on more of kind of a personal level, sometimes because maybe our own sins and the things that we've done are just hanging so closely to us that we can't help but think that. Maybe there's something we need to let go of. Maybe there's something that we need to ask forgiveness for. Maybe there's something we need to forgive. Maybe there's something that's happening or coming down the line for which, excuse me, we feel we need to prepare ourselves. Whatever it is, Matthew shows us that this sort of baptism is more. Yes, and Jesus' ministry was in a place that needed light for everyone, and his kingdom would bring it. The Greek word for kingdom is basileia, and it literally means a place that requires a leader, a place that requires a ruler, a king, for example. But Jesus, in adopting John's ministry of repent for the kingdom is near, means that the kingdom from which he is talking about is not one of tyranny. 
and it's not one of violence. And again, we can point to so many places in history that would that would define that before Jesus and since Jesus. Uh, it, it, in what Jesus is doing in heading back to the land of Zebulun and Naphtali and going to Galilee and beginning this assembling his crew is he's picking up his clipboard. And in this week's reading, he steps into public ministry and delivers his first sermon, repent for the Basileia of heaven, the Basileia of peace, the Basileia of forgiveness, the Basileia of wholeness and light has come near. That kingdom is most clearly demonstrated in Jesus on the cross, the place where God reveals the kind of king that he has for the kind of kingdom that he brings, a kingdom of self-giving love. And Jesus returning from the tomb reveals God's delight in that self-giving love. When you give of yourself, when you give everything, I won't forget that. I will redeem it. And so Jesus, knowing that this is a rather large task, that the tyrant has crossed a line and that the kingdom that that tyrant is exhibiting to the world is a kingdom that will always fail. Jesus, knowing that the kingdom of peace and light coming into the world will need people to help him with, he begins to assemble people to work in his basileia. And so he goes to some where some men are working. And now we're back to fishing. <laughs> I knew we'd get back there eventually. But wait, even though we're back to the fishing, there's a little more that's happening underneath the surface that we might not know about. We might, we need a little bit of cultural and historical context. Ched Myers, who is a, a, um, a, a theologian who looks at the social aspect and the cultural aspect of the Gospels, uh, wrote a, on a blog called Radical Discipleship that these guys, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, did not own their work. Now, we usually think of these guys fishing as like you, the guys you see along the side of the road who are by a creek who have, you know, all the fishing gear in the trunk of their car and they've got the poles in. We usually think of it like that. It's not like that. This was an industry. And it was an industry that was being reshaped by Rome for the benefit of Rome. If you are familiar with the old song, 16 tons, you load 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. You get an idea of what life would have been like. Back breaking work that delivers no profit to themselves and just barely enough for them to live on. Ched Myers wrote this. If Tiberius, that land right there that the Romans called Tiberius, was ground zero in Herod's project of Romanizing the regional economy, then Capernaum up the coast, a village profoundly impacted by such policies, was the logical place to commence building a movement of resistance. Restless peasant fishermen had little to lose and everything to gain by overturning the status quo. So Jesus' strategic decision was not unlike Gandhi's attempts to mobilize the untouchable classes in India in campaigns such as the famous Salt March, or of Martin Luther King Jr.'s faith, fateful choice to stand with the sanitation workers in Memphis in the spring of 1968. Ched Myers suggests that Jesus, in calling these guys, knew what their lives were like, knew that they were owned by this tyrannical uh, ruler and knew they didn't have much to lose and they had a lot to gain. They were ready to let go of what their life was like, what the old system was like, because they had nothing. 
and there was no future for them. So when Jesus saw them and said, come with me, follow me, I'll teach you to fish for people. They were like, you bet, you better believe it because there's nothing for me here. Now, I have to admit, I really kind of like that interpretation because it really suggests that people were ready, ready for what Jesus was going to do, ready to let go of what was wrong and ready to take on something that would bring something new. They didn't know what, but they knew Jesus and they knew they could trust him. And so they followed him into the light that he was bringing. Now, for our contemporary situation, it doesn't need to be fishermen in, that are being called. That's just the hook for this story. It could be migrant workers. Follow me. Come work in my fields. It could be teachers. Follow me. Learn what I have to teach and then teach it yourselves. It could be healthcare professionals. Follow me. Watch how I heal. Use the scientific knowledge that you have, but watch how I look at people who are sick. See them as a whole person and touch them where they need healing. It could be anyone. Anyone who's ready for something different in this world. As we seek to follow Jesus, we are called to embrace God's light and turn away from darkness. And this means that we must learn to become people of truth, integrity, faithfulness, grace, and justice, who oppose dishonesty, expediency, insincerity, and especially injustice. This is why Jesus called his followers the light of the world. And we'll get into that in the next couple of weeks. To fight the darkness, to fight the things that are crowding out the light, all we need to do is let our little light shine, as that old Sunday school song said. John Vandelar says, it is only in community as we support, encourage, and challenge one another that we can grow better and better at reflecting Christ's light. And as we live like Jesus, we too will bring healing and freedom to others. So think of it this way. Every morning, the sun rises and the light comes back into the world. And we get up and we begin our day. For Jesus, this time of calling his disciples was his way of saying, God has started a new day. Get up. We've got a job to do. Our job is to be suffused with the light that God has brought into this world, take it out into our world so all the dark places can be illuminated. We're in the season of Epiphany, as I've said last week. It's the time where God's light, is sh God's light shines, and this story today points to God's saving light, the basileia that God brings in Jesus, which is continually on the move to the ends of the earth, as well as to the innermost reaches of the human heart. This story invites us not to lament over how gloomy things are, because they are, <laughs> but instead to lively, imaginatively follow the light of Jesus through whatever darkness we're in. The disciples followed Jesus and trusted him for the same reasons that we do, because he doesn't hide his face from us. We can experience his love, his mercy, and his grace, even amid suffering. So thanks be to God for the gift of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and was raised 
to set us free. Amen. All right. Our next hymn is number 325. 